welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. It's been a difficult week in some sense as I was thinking about just some of the events that have taken place in this week. I heard through a news outlet how the Grammy Awards, where it's an appreciation in America for all the uh, musical artists, it's the place where you get the greatest commendation, where they apparently had a sort of concert where they had this picture of Satan and they were glorying and dancing to some song called as unholy. Then I heard that the Church of England have now deemed that they would bless the union of a gay couple. And then just a couple of days ago I heard that there was this big earthquake in Turkey and tens of thousands of people have been killed. More closer to home, I learned uh, this week that one of my pastor friends, his uh, teenage son is just having questions about God and lacks interest in God and he's very troubled by his son. Another close pastor friend of mine, he was telling me of the various difficulties in his church and he doesn't know how long he is going to be at that church because of all the issues that are going on in that church. And then I heard the news that a distant relative of mine, but someone who's uh, about the same age as me, and we grew up together at least, uh, primary school and went to church together and went to Sunday school together, of how he contracted hepatitis and died within a span of three to four days. He leaves behind his wife and two young children. How has your life been? How has your week been? Maybe as Paul said, you've been aware more and more of your sin. Or maybe life is, you know, this past week as you look at it has just been quite mundane and ordinary. Or maybe life is good for you and you're prospering and things are going great. Or perhaps you find yourself fighting sin and temptation and it knows no end. Or perhaps you're going through some deep trial right now. Maybe it's a trial in your family. Maybe a a trial at your workplace. Some trial of sickness or financial crisis or something else. No matter where you find your life this morning, what I want to encourage you from God's word this morning 
is that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God is with you. And I want to ask you this morning, do you actually believe that? That God is with you? Do you believe that God is with you when life seems mundane? Do you believe that God is with you when life is prospering and everything is going wonderful? Do you believe that God is with you when you are facing temptation and trying to resist sin? And do you believe that God is with you when you are going through a trial, even if you're going through a difficult trial right now? Do you really believe that God is with you? Brothers and sisters, that's what I want to encourage you this morning because that is exactly what we find from the text that we're going to look at from Genesis 39. That this truth of God's presence with his people wouldn't simply be an, an intellectual thing in your mind. But you and I would be refreshed once again, reminded, maybe even renewed in your understanding of what it means that God is with his people. Through every every sphere of life, every season of life. And I pray that as you recognize that truth and, and that truth begins to impact your life more and more as you experience it daily, I, I pray that your life would also reflect that truth that God is with you. I've titled this morning's sermon as God was with Joseph. Not a particularly fancy title, but that's really the the big truth of this chapter. God was with Joseph. And we're going to look at this chapter under three headings, under three scenes. And how God was with Joseph in all these three circumstances. Where God was with Joseph when Joseph was interacting with Potiphar in verses 1 through to 6a. When Joseph was with Potiphar's wife of how God was with him. And then in verses 13 to 23 of how God was with Joseph even as he was thrown in prison. And I pray that as you see this truth from God's word this morning, it would encourage you with regards to who God is and who he is in your life. And, it would, and your life would reflect that reality each and every day. So firstly, first scene, Joseph with Potiphar and how God was with him in that instance. Verse 1 says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, An Egyptian had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. It says, Joseph had been brought down. He was forcefully brought down to Egypt as a slave. You know, the psalm that we read this morning shed some more light about how Joseph was treated. If you turn to Psalm 105, verses 17 and 18, it says this. 
that he, talking about God, he sent a man ahead of them, meaning ahead of Joseph's family. And that man was Joseph who was sold as a slave. And it says in verse 18 that his feet were hurt with fetters and his neck was put in a collar of iron. So I want you to imagine this at this point. It wouldn't have been a pleasant journey for Joseph as he traveled to, as he was taken to Egypt. There's an iron collar around his neck, chains around his feet to prevent him from escaping, as how slaves would have been treated in those days. And as Psalmist even says that his feet were hurt with all this. You know, it's quite likely that Joseph would have been manhandled. He wouldn't have been treated nicely and with respect. You know, thinking of human rights and things like that. Oh no, the Ishmaelites who had brought Joseph would have treated him just like a slave. Pushing him and shoving him and, you know, pulling the iron chains this way and that way. Treating him like a rag doll. Maybe even beating him to keep him in line with others. As they moved along that caravan and uh, as they journeyed on a few weeks to Egypt. And I'm pretty sure most of the slaves would have the bare minimum with regards to food and water. And in Egypt... Joseph is then put up, on, put up on sale as a slave. He's just treated as an animal. A again, sold off, you know, ready to be sold off as a slave to whoever would pay top dollar. Now, another thing I want you to understand is at this point in time, at this time in history, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. Great military power. Great advances in education and architecture and many other things. They were very forward, culturally speaking. It was a very prosperous nation, and so it was a great place to do business. So the Ishmaelites have brought Joseph down as a slave to Egypt and he's now being sold off as a slave and a man named Potiphar buys Joseph. And the text says that Potiphar was the captain of the guard, an officer of Pharaoh. You could say Potiphar was the head of Pharaoh's personal bodyguard. Such that, you know, anyone who came personally against Pharaoh, his personal prisoners would be under Potiphar's rule. And Potiphar would have most likely been a wealthy man, a powerful man, and he was indeed a high-ranking official in Egypt, an officer of Pharaoh. And here you have Joseph a slave in his house. I mean, what a turn of events for Joseph, isn't it? If you remember from what we know, what we've learned about Joseph, he was the beloved son of his father, the most favored sons over all other sons. You know, he even had that special coat from his father to prove it. Joseph was the young man who had dreams where God revealed to him that he would rule over his household one day. But as a result of all this favoritism and hearing this is what God's plan is for Joseph... 
Joseph's brothers hated him even more. They wanted to kill him. They threw him in a pit. And then finally, in God's providence, he was sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And now he's forcibly been brought into this foreign land, away from the comforts of his home, brought as a slave, beaten and, you know, chains and all, and with bruises everywhere, sold as a commodity, treated as an animal, and now he's a slave in this big Egyptian official's house. Now, things might not look good for Joseph at this point. You know, mind you, he's a, he's a young man. He, he's about 17 years old. But what I also want you to understand is that it was no accident that Joseph ended up in Egypt or that he specifically ended up as the slave of this high-ranking Egyptian officer. God was at work, and he was sovereignly bringing out his plans, which would display his glory, but it was also ultimately for the good of Joseph and the people of Israel as well. Look at what verse verse 2 says. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, what does it mean that the Lord was with Joseph? I mean, we know from the Bible that the Lord is present everywhere, right? We know him as the omnipresent God. So the Lord specifically being with Joseph is really more so to say, talk about God's favorable presence with Joseph. It's it's basically the special favorable presence of the Lord that is always present with his people. You know, Jesus' promise in Matthew 28 where he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's talking about that favorable presence of the Lord Jesus. Or when we say to other believers, the Lord be with you. Or even from Numbers 6, we know the ironic blessing, you know, the Lord be with you. The Lord causes face to shine on you. It's Specifically calling on, saying, may the Lord's favor be on you. May his special presence with his people, may that continue to be with you. And so the verse says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. You know, I believe that Joseph understood that the Lord was with him in a favorable sense. I believe that Joseph truly trusted in the Lord and in God's promises to his forefathers. He he truly trusted the Lord with what he had revealed in his dreams. And he was living in light of that, according to the Lord's ways. Now you might be saying, but why do you say that, Benoit? Just look at the next verse. It says that his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Now who's his master? Potiphar. And who's Potiphar? An Egyptian. A pagan, idol-worshipping aristocrat. But how does Potiphar, this pagan idol-worshipping officer, know that the Lord, 
Not just any God, but the Lord, Yahweh, is with Joseph. And that it is Yahweh that is causing Joseph to succeed. How does Potiphar, this idol worshipper, know that? I mean, it's a pagan land. Everybody around worships idols in Egypt. So the only thing we can assume is that Potiphar knew that Joseph worshipped Yahweh. Potiphar knew exactly that Joseph worshipped the Lord God. And we have to assume that Joseph told Potiphar about Yahweh. You know, perhaps when Potiphar would commend Joseph on something that he did, oh, you know, great job, Joseph. Where Joseph would be pointing it back to Yahweh. No, it's not me ultimately. It's Yahweh, my God, that is giving me success. He gives me the grace to do all this work well. What you have here is a pagan officer seeing the work and life of Joseph. And he's bearing testimony to the fact the Lord Yahweh is with you and is giving you success. And so it says, verse 4, So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. See, Joseph was so trustworthy, so diligent, so wise as a slave that Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything in his house and everything in the field. And because of Joseph's presence and his way of doing things, the Lord also blessed Potiphar's house. You know, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here Joseph feared the Lord and he trusted the Lord and he was walking according to his ways, seeking to honor the Lord. And guess what happened? It affected his attitude. It affected his work ethic. It affected how he treated others. You know, perhaps Joseph was the only slave who wasn't complaining. There was something different about this slave. Perhaps Joseph was the only slave that was so diligent in his work compared to everyone else. Perhaps Joseph was the only slave that treated even others with respect because he saw everyone made in the image of God. And when asked, Joseph, why are you like this? He's always pointing back to the Lord. It is the Lord who is with me, and he gives me success. See, one of the things that God does, that when as believers we trust the Lord and walk according to his ways, we experience the blessing of walking according to his ways. Because when God says, live a certain way, and when we walk according to that way, there's only blessing that comes. Because it's his perfect way. And it's not just that we experience the blessing, but a lot of the times that that blessing will then flow on to our family members and our neighbors and our workplace and, and, and beyond. 
So, for example, at your workplace, you want to honor the Lord and represent Christ. So you work diligently. And you are trustworthy to do that which is only good for the institution. You treat others respectfully. What do you think is going to happen to you as an employee? Well, you experience the blessing of walking according to God's way. Sometimes it's just the joy of knowing that you're walking according to God's ways. Other times it may be other temporal blessings as well. And then beyond that, because you are a worker like this who wants to honor the Lord and who does what is good for that institution, that institution overall is also being blessed because of you. Because of your presence there. Because you want to honor the Lord and that blessing is now going forward. See, brothers and sisters, the point is this. When we prosper, that prospering is, is not an end in itself. But it is so that we can point back to the God who is with us. To point back to His character and His grace in our lives. And perhaps that will even give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ to others and further draw more people to this great God. Or similarly within your family. If you're a Christian and you're seeking to honor the Lord, you know, maybe as a son or a daughter or a sibling or a spouse or even as a parent, there will be times when not only will you experience the blessing of walking in His ways, but others too in your family will be blessed because of you walking that way. As a faithful child or a faithful sibling or a faithful parent or a faithful spouse, that blessing will flow on to those around you as well. And the point of that is that then it gives you an opportunity to say, God is with me because I am walking in His ways. It's not an opportunity to brag about how good we've been and how meticulous we've been. But it's an opportunity to say, God is with me and to draw others and point others to this great and good God. So in this first scene, as Joseph interacts with Potiphar, we see of how God was indeed with Joseph. And this now brings us to the second scene. Joseph with Potiphar's wife. From verse 6b, the second half of 6, to verse 12. Now it says there, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. You know, Rachel, Joseph's mother, was described similarly. So it runs in the family. Joseph is a good-looking fellow and has a great physique, just like his mother. And the text mentions this precisely because what's going to happen next. Verse 7 says, And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. So some time has passed. Scripture doesn't say how long. 
But some time has passed. Joseph has become Potiphar's right-hand man, managing all the affairs of the home on behalf of Potiphar, where Potiphar has no care in the world. And so as a result of being around the home so often, he would have had frequent interactions with Mrs. Potiphar. And the text says that she cast her eyes on Joseph. Or in other words, she lusted after Joseph. And she said, lie with me. You know, this is, it, it, it's a command here that she gives. It's an imperative. Lie with me. Joseph now finds himself in a difficult predicament. Potiphar's wife, she has a lot of power and influence. But Joseph, on the other hand, he's a, he's a nobody at this stage. He's, he's a mere slave in that house. And now Potiphar's wife is commanding Joseph to lie with her. You know, in those days, it, it wasn't uncommon for people in power to get whatever they wanted for their own gratification, whatever pleasures or favors it may be from their slaves. It wasn't uncommon during those times. And you must also understand that, again, Joseph is a young man, only about 17 years of age. You know, his hormones, like any young man, would have been at its full force. And he could have easily reasoned to himself, oh, you know, other family members of mine, you know, they've indulged in uh, sexual intimacy outside of marriage. So, you know, perhaps I could do it too. Or he could have said, you know, my master, so trust me, he's hardly ever here. So no one's going to find out if I comply this woman just this one time. Or he could have reasoned, oh, oh you know, in any case, I- I'm a slave. I have no rights to, to refuse my authority. I can't refuse Potiphar's wife because if I refuse her, I'm pretty sure that things are going to go bad for me. So I might as well just give in. But remarkably, Joseph doesn't give in. And listen to what he says. Verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is no greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph is saying, my my master has put me in charge of everything and he trusts, because he trusts me so much. He hasn't kept anything from me except you because you're his wife. See, here's what Joseph is essentially saying. So he's saying, I can't be disloyal to my master. And what you're asking me to do is strictly reserved for the marriage bed. And to defile the marriage bed, that's a great sin against my Lord. So Joseph understood that it's not just sinning or being disloyal to his master, but he also understood that it would be sinning against his Lord, against his Yahweh. But Potiphar's wife was persistent. Notice verse 10. But as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or be with her. 
See, day after day, this woman would come after him to lie with her or at least to just spend some time with her and he would just completely refuse and go from there. Then verse 11 says, But one day, when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were, was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. See, Joseph knew that if he stayed there in that moment with that woman, he would sin against the Lord. And so he fled from that woman, leaving that outer garment of his still in her hands. Now I want to ask you something. How is it that Joseph could resist this great temptation? I mean, he's no superhuman. There are no superhumans. There's no perfect human beings other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. Then why is it that Joseph, this young man, could resist this temptation? Well, I would say the reason was because Joseph knew that the Lord was with him. See, Joseph feared the Lord and trusted the Lord. He would have known about the Abrahamic promises. He would have known that these Abrahamic promises Promises would then flow down to his children, to whoever followed the Lord, that they too in turn would be blessed and would be a blessing to others. He knew that one day God would send a savior to save his people. He knew that God had revealed to him that he would one day rule over his household. He knew the reason for his success in Potiphar's house was because of the Lord. Potiphar finding, him finding favor in Potiphar's eyes was all God's doing. So in other words, Joseph had a great sense of who the Lord is and his purposes. He understood that the Lord was with him and for him and the Lord's favor rested on him. And so he couldn't bring himself to sin against his Lord. And that love for the Lord then overflows into his love for neighbor where he says, I don't want to be disloyal to my master. Because he serves his master, because he sees that as serving the Lord. So let me ask you this morning, for those of us who are Christians, how can we fight sin and resist temptation when it comes our way? You know, is it merely by you know, just thinking, thou shalt not do it, and that's the end of it? Or putting up some barriers? Is that the only way we are going to fight sin and resist temptation? No, that won't last too long. No, it has to be deeper than that. Something has to be there at our heart level. See, when our heart is secure in the Lord, secure in the fact that the Lord is with me, His favor is on me, He is for me, and our heart is so full of the Lord, so to speak, there's now no room for the heart to keep anything else there, to lust after anything else there. Now, if you're thinking, well, Benoit, how, how do I do that practically? Well, good question. Here's, here's a way we can do this practically by being in God's Word. 
and by seeing God's character and glory more and more. You know, we talked about this recently at our men's group as it relates to how we read God's word and how we then pray back what we've read based on what we've read back to God. And here's perhaps some helpful things that you can do as you read God's word. So when you read God's word, look for what that passage says about God's character and God's promises and God's work and, and, and in light of that, give praise to God for his character and thank him for what he's doing or his promises in future. And then as you see God's character in God's word, in light of that, or in light of perhaps there's an example, a human example, that's given in the text that you're reading. Shine God's word then into your own heart and see, now in light of what is God is saying and who he is and what he's cause, wanting us to do, are there sinful tendencies in my heart that I need to confess to the Lord? And this confession of sin is so important, something that we need to do daily, if not regularly, in light of even what Jesus has said in his model prayer. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others. Are you doing that regularly? Shining God's word into your own heart and life and, and confessing your sin to the Lord. But then don't re remain there. Then run to the cross of Christ. And remember what Jesus has done for you on that cross. Both for the forgiveness of your sin and, and for the power to change from the inside out. And say, God, so now help me to live for you this day. That's how you, you know, as you're reading God's word and you're looking for these things and you're confessing sin. And then you pray those things back to God. And you know what happens over time? As you daily see the character of God and the glory of God in his word, and in light of that, you, you know, and then you shine scripture back into your heart and life, and, and if there's sins that you need to confess, you confess that, and then you're daily rehearsing the gospel of Jesus Christ to yourself and all the implications that come out from that. You know what's going to happen as you do that daily? You will grow in your love for the Lord. You will grow in your joy in the Lord. You will grow in your peace because you realize more and more God's favor on you in and through Jesus Christ. How he really is for you and with you. And then you begin to see God's goodness everywhere around you. And then your heart starts becoming more and more tender towards sin. And you begin to see your sin way quicker. And as quickly as you see your sin, you run to the cross again even more quicker. And you turn away from it because you don't want to displease the Lord. And you know what happens as a result? Because that has an ongoing effect as well. As you grow in your understanding, you confess sin and you realize, no, but God's wrath is not on me. He poured it on, on Jesus. He, his favor is on me in and through Christ. And you see your sin and you're confessing it. You realize even more, how much has God loved me? Even though I'm a wretched sinner today, even though I've failed today, God's love for me has not changed as I look to the cross. And because God sent his son to die on the cross, I now have the power through the Holy Spirit and have hope of change. 
And, and so you become more secure in the Lord. Oh yes, the Lord is for me. Yes, I fail, but I'm so secure in Him. He is with me. He is for me. He has shown me that through Jesus Christ. And you're rehearsing that each and every day. And you know what else will happen then? It will affect how you view others and how you treat others. You will grow in your love for others. Because the more you realize how you've been forgiven, even though you don't deserve it, the more you will learn to love others. What does Jesus say? To the one who is forgiven little, loves little. But the one who is forgiven much, loves much. And so that's how God enables us to live steadfastly unto him. And that's what we see with Joseph. Joseph, who, he knew who the Lord was. He knew what the Lord had promised. He knew that the Lord was with him and for him and his favor was on him. And so it impacted how he treated others. He was tender towards sin. He saw it as an offense to God primarily and then overflowing from there, it was a sin against his neighbor. So how is it that Joseph was able to overcome sin, resist temptation? The same way any believer can overcome sin and resist temptation. Because he was very conscious of the fact that the Lord was with him. That the no and that knowledge of God's favor sustained him from sinning against the Lord and sinning against his neighbor. That brings us to our last scene of how God was with Joseph as he was thrown in prison. So Joseph is seeking to honor the Lord and honor his neighbor. And so as a result of that, he flees from that temptation. He runs away. That's the right thing to do. But you know, things don't go very well, at least immediately for Joseph. Potiphar's wife was out for revenge because Joseph had rejected her. And so what Potiphar's wife does is she calls out to the men and she blames her husband and makes false accusations about Joseph. Look at verse 13. As soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he, that's referring to Potiphar, has brought amongst us a Hebrew. You know, she's using it in a derogatory sense because in those days, Egyptians weren't particularly fond of the Hebrews. So Potiphar has brought this Hebrew amongst us to, to laugh at us, to take advantage of us and to make a mockery of us. And notice what she's trying to do here, where she's trying to include everyone in this. She says, to laugh at us, to take advantage of us and, and mock us. You know, she's, she's trying to win votes for herself, get everyone against Joseph and get everyone on her side. Maybe she's hoping to rile up some of the other slaves who may have had some seeds of jealousy perhaps to this Hebrew slave who's now risen to so much of power. To say, oh, this Hebrew slave who's come to mock us all. And then she outright lies. Where she says, and he came into me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And she says, look, I have Joseph's outer garment to prove that. And then she waits for her husband to come home and she tells him the same lies. 
verses 16 through 18. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Why is she, what is she doing here? Well, she's essentially telling Potiphar, this is your poor judgment to bring this slave into our house. You brought this on me, Potiphar. Now you do something about it. That's what she's doing here. This is your slave that you brought. So verse 19, it says, As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. You know, normally for a crime like this, the slave would be executed. But the fact that Potiphar spares Joseph's life and throws him into prison where the king's other prisoners were kept should make us think, well, why did he do that? You know, Potiphar surely knew Joseph's character. Joseph had been around for at least a while and that's why Joseph was that's why Potiphar left Joseph fully in charge of all of Potiphar's household affairs. He knew Joseph's character. But I'm also sure that Potiphar knew the character of his wife as well. And what she would have been up to, especially when he was away from home. Because this was not an uncommon thing during those times. And as some commentators have pointed out, it doesn't say who Potiphar was angry at. It just says that he was angry. Is he angry with Joseph? Or is he angry with his wife? Or is he angry at the whole situation that he's going to lose a faithful steward like Joseph and there's nothing he can do about it? I think Potiphar is angry at the whole situation where he doesn't believe his wife but there's nothing he can do about it because he has to take his wife's word. He can't take the word of a slave. And so he knows he's going to lose Joseph. And yet, instead of killing him, therefore, he puts him in prison. And this prison, as we'll see in the next chapter, is actually in Potiphar's house, the king's prison. And in some of the interactions, again, in the next chapter leads me to believe that Potiphar still trusted in Joseph and his character. Now, as far as Joseph is concerned, he's a slave. He has no rights. There's no court of appeal, no fair trial, nothing. You know, at this point, Joseph could have gone down into despair saying, I've tried to honor the Lord with everything. But life just keeps getting worse. I've been falsely charged. I've been taken out of my home, hated by my brothers, left to be dead, then treated as an animal. Then I come here, I've tried to be faithful. Now I'm falsely charged, mistreated, and now dealt with unjustly. Now I'm thrown in prison. You know, Potiphar, uh, Joseph could have easily said, I don't think the Lord is with me. I think he's actually abandoned me. I think he's against me, if anything. But look at what the text tells us. Verse 21 onwards. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. 
The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made him succeed. See, Joseph didn't despair. He continued believing in the Lord. He still continued to believe that the Lord was with him. And it impacted the way that he was in prison as well. Where his character shined through and his interactions with others shined through. And the prison keeper took notice of that. There's something different about this prisoner. And made Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. And here's the wonderful thing. Right now, Joseph is in prison. But if we zoom back a little bit, God is sovereignly directing Joseph's steps. See, God wanted Joseph to be specifically in that house of Potiphar. God wanted Joseph to be specifically in that special prison where the king's prisoners would go. So that it would then provide opportunity for Joseph to meet with certain other prisoners of the king. Which would then later cause him to meet Pharaoh and then become Pharaoh's right hand man. And then where God would use Joseph to save the people of Israel and declare his glory. But Joseph didn't know all these specifics about what God was doing. He didn't know any of this. All Joseph knew was that God was with him. And he was trusting in God's promises. And knowing that God's favor rested on him helped him to persevere even when he was in this difficult trial. What you see here is the glory of God on display when Joseph is prospering as he points back to the Lord, as Joseph is in temptation and resisting sin and he's pointing back to the Lord, and as he's going through a trial and facing false accusation and imprisonment and he's pointing back to the Lord and seeking to honor the Lord even in his suffering. God was providentially at work to display his glory and to do that which is good for Joseph, even though some of those times have been hard. You know, as I've come to a close, there's one word and explain that word and some of the implications of that. And the word is God's providence. Providence. The Heidelberg Catechism defines God's providence this way. It is his almighty and ever-present power, whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds the heaven and the earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, Fruitful and barren years, food and drink, riches and poverty, indeed all things come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, do you believe that? That everything in life comes to us from his fatherly hand. The fruitful years and the barren years. Riches and poverty. Rain and drought. Good and bad. They all come to us from his fatherly hand.
You know, the challenge for us even, I was thinking about my own life, is it's easy to say, yes, God is providentially caring for me when things are going great. But what about when you and I are going through a trial, perhaps a deep trial, a long season of trial? Can we say this is God's providential care in my life? Because it comes from his fatherly hand? Can we say, even in the deep trials as we go through, as we see suffering and we go through different seasons of life, God is still with me. And he's still working for my good and for his glory. Lord, here's the thing. I think it was John Piper many years ago, he said in a sermon, God in any instance is doing a million things. And we might be aware of three of them. Maybe even, not even three. Oh, as another theologian put it, you know, if you see a marvelous artist beginning his brush strokes of paint, puts a stroke like this and stroke like that, and we judge the artist by that and say, this is rubbish. This is no good. We don't understand that the artist hasn't finished painting. Beloved, good or bad, drought or rain, fruitful season or barren season, joyous season or deep trial season, God is with you and for you and providentially caring for you. And while we might not understand the big picture of what he is doing, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he's doing it for his glory. And he's doing it for your ultimate good. And so I pray that this sermon would help us to realize that grand reality of God is with you. Emmanuel, God, is with us. That's what, that's what we talk about Jesus, right? Yeah, he, he will never forsake us. He will always be there for us. His favor he has already shown, and there's more favor to come. And the ultimate favor is to be in his presence and to enjoy him forever. So whether hills or valleys, troubled times or joyous times, let's live in light of the fact that God is with us and that we, therefore, live in light of that glorious truth each day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the, the holy, holy, holy God you are. Your judgments are unsearchable. Your ways we cannot fully understand. And you, yet you have a perfect plan. You had the end before the beginning. You knew the end before the beginning. And we thank you for the privilege to be called your children, how, how you are working out your plan, even in and through our lives, in the fabric of your great plan. Help us to realize more and more of your providential care for us. Help us to realize more and more of your favor toward us, that you are with your people, that you will never leave us, never forsake us, that you will never do anything to harm us. You will only do that which is for your glory and ultimately for our good. So help us, Lord, as a result, to trust you and to live in light of that great reality. And in doing so, no matter what season of life we may be in, help us to point back to you and give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.